Hi, I'm Yoel Finkelman, curator of the Judaica collection at the National Library of Israel. Hi, I'm Nahama Goldman Barish. I'm a senior faculty member at the Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. And today we're going to be introducing some of the holidays of the month of Tishrei, the autumn holidays of the Jewish calendar. And we'll be doing so by introducing you to documents and manuscripts from the rare book collection of the National Library. Particularly this marvelous example of Spanish Hebrew manuscript tradition, this complete Hebrew Bible from 1260, over 700 years ago. The verses in Leviticus begin describing the cycle of the Jewish year. Ele moade Adonai mikra kodesh asher tikru otam bemoadam. These are the holidays of God, the set times of God, which you shall declare at their proper time. And in particular, as we move on, we get a description of the holidays of the what later became known as the month of Tishrei in the fall. Vayidaber Adonai el Moshe lemor b'chodesh ha-shvi'i b'echad l'chodesh yelachem shabaton zichron trua mikra kodesh. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Mark the first day in the seventh month. You shall observe it as a complete rest, a sacred occasion commemorated with loud blasts. Later on in the same chapter, Vayedaber Adonai el Moshe lemor, Ach be'esor l'chodesh ha-shvi'i ha-zeh yom ha-kippurim hu, mikra kodesh yelachem, v'initem et nafshotechem, ki yom kippur hu l'chaper alechem l'fnei Adonai Eloichem. Now what we have here is the 10th day of the seventh month, so nine days after the earlier holiday, we have a holiday that's described as the Day of Atonement, also a sacred occasion, but the Torah says you shall practice self-denial, and that self-denial is going to be that which brings expiation made on your behalf, says the Bible. So here we have two holidays, one after the other. The first, which includes some kind of blast, but we don't know exactly what, and the second, a little more than a week later, focusing on repentance and expiation. The idea of both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as high holidays, when the community comes together to repent and pray through a fixed liturgy, really only develops after the Second Temple when it's destroyed in 70 CE, when there are no longer communal sacrifices to represent the community. And that really turns the holidays into very solemn days in which many hours are spent in prayer and dialogue in God. And what emerges is a special prayer book known as a machsor, in which people pray specifically on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And the idea of the Machzor is to bring the community together, both collectively and individual, as individuals, to reflect on their commitment to God, on uh, divine control over history on Rosh Hashanah, on the shofar blowing on Rosh Hashanah, and then on Yom Kippur turning inward toward admitting one's own weaknesses, admitting one's own faults, admitting one's sins, and thinking about how one could go about changing and fixing those. I think those are themes that are frankly pretty universal, and there's something to be said about dedicating time over the course of the year to our own uh, failings and our own difficulties and attempts to improve ourselves. But throughout the Jewish liturgy, the Machzor was filled with more and more liturgical poems that reflected these various ideas of repentance and forgiveness. And if we go back to the earliest documents that we have in the National Library collection, we see that this is one of the earliest Yom Kippur Machzorim. It's really only one page from an early Yom Kippur Machzor from the 11th and 12th century. We're talking about uh, a document from the Cairo Gniza, which is justifiably internationally famous as a source of hundreds of thousands of pages related to the Jewish community in the old city of Fustat and Cairo. And here we have just one short poem from the ancient uh, poet Eliezer HaKalir. It's barely legible, but it is a, uh, it is a poem that would be recited uh, by the community or by an individual on, on Yom Kippur. 
And what's really fascinating is that um, while some of the liturgy, some of the prayers overlap on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there really are distinct differences. Rosh Hashanah is about the beginning of the year, about new beginnings, about standing in judgment before God. But there's still a joyousness to the tone of some of the prayers. And on Yom Kippur, it is far more solemn and even foreboding. One of the central prayers is something called vidui or confession, which is actually traditionally said on deathbeds. So here you are saying a prayer made up of 53 lines in which each individual confesses to a long list of sins, a fixed list, entirely having to do with our behavior to one another, which is also interesting, right? That what we're confessing are sins to fellow human beings, even more centrally than uh, sins before God. And we say them as individuals, and then we say them again as part of the community, and it reinforces the communal aspect of confession and individual accountability. So each person enunciates this list of 53 sins and lightly bangs on his chest in order to reinforce his atonement for every specific transgression, either as an individual or as part of a community. And I, I can tell you from personal experience, it's not always as painful and uncomfortable as it sounds. There's something almost refreshing about Cathartic, it. Cathartic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's take a look at some of the larger and more elaborate machzorim in our collection. So this is one of the most beautiful and important machzorim in the National Library collection. It's referred to as machzor worms, the worms machzor, because uh, it was used from when it was written uh, not far away from worms in, in the Rhineland in Germany um, in the 1270s. It was used until uh, Kristallnacht, until 1938, uh, by the Jewish community of Worms as the machzor for the community uh, on, on the high holidays. So it was really used for like 700 years, and we know that the only reason it survived Kristallnacht is because the city archivist uh, retrieved it and put it into the cathedral uh, for the duration of the war, and it was, uh, it was returned to the Jewish community in the 1950s and eventually made its way here to the National Library. You can see some of the absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful illustrations in this wonderful Northern European uh, machzor. Um, and, but I really want to focus on some of the more famous prayers from, from the High Holidays. And we can begin here with Unetane uh, Tokef Kedushat Hayom, an ancient uh, Piyut, an ancient liturgical poem that focuses on the experience of dread and judgment and the sense of the unknown, the sense that what might happen in the coming year is impossible to determine and that our own behavior, our own focus on repentance, our own focus on kindness to others, our own focus on returning to God are the things that might determine whether or not the coming year turns out well or turns out unsuccessfully given the unknown. Yeah, and, um, and really, what is mo it is a prayer that is said both on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and the idea that we have no idea what the year brings, who will live and who will die, uh, who will be born and who will, who will you know, be swept up in, a, in, in water or in fire. Uh, it's very, very chilling and very reminiscent of our frailty, of our mortality. And yet, like you said at the end, giving us some agency that repentance, that good deeds and, and charity can avert the evil decree, right? We live with uh, vulnerability and we try to nonetheless take control by, you know, being more responsible in our lives. What I love though, Yoah, I'd like you to tell me these little handwritten notations, mm -hmm. um, really almost on every line on this page are quite uh, startling. What's going on there? Well, drawing in the margins of an ancient artifact like this would be unthinkable today, but this is demonstration of the fact that this was not a museum piece for the community. This was in use, and the cantors, the chazanim, would write notes to themselves in the margins as traditions changed, as wording changed, as different practices changed, so that they could constantly update the liturgy to reflect their own styles, their own focuses, as well as the priorities of the community. Yeah, and you really see different handwritings as you're looking through the book. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and here, perhaps the most famous few words of the high holiday liturgy for Erev Yom Kippur, the evening upon which Yom Kippur begins, Kol Nidre, 
uh, all of the oaths. And really that's about being responsible for promises that we make, right? Being accountable for the consequences of the words that we say and how we relate to other human beings. And, uh, and that's really the power of the prayer, that we open up Yom Kippur taking responsibility for our actions, particularly our verbal actions. One last page, which perhaps focuses more than anything else on the theme of the Yom Kippur liturgy, is what you mentioned before, al -chet. These are the sins that we've done, and there's this formal alphabetical list that you can recite, but certainly there's place here for each individual to look inward and say, one second, where have I gone wrong in the past year? And this really ties in, we talked about Kol Nidre, about verbal accountability, and many of the transgressions here are about verbal transgression. Uh, cursing, acting with arrogance, taking false oaths, treating parents with disrespect. And so it forces you again and again to realize how not random consequence is, that a lot of times it's our own uh, place in the, in the process. Can I show you two more medieval machzorim from our collection. This is one of the most important and well-known uh, machzorim. It's from Catalonia, and it was prepared in 1280. Um, and it actually begins with a series of pages of mycography, uh, of images that are created out of minuscule letters. Here we see you can see it some if I look birds. really close. Otherwise Here we can like, see a eagle of some kind attacking uh, a, uh, a gazelle. We have a dragon of some sort with, with growth coming out of its mouth, uh, more hunting scenes, more nature scenes, uh, really a very wide variety of, of nature and hunting scenes, a knight as well. And there isn't necessarily a close connection between the liturgy and these images, but there is something uh, striking and beautiful about them. Uh, there is a connection here, a Spanish tradition of the Iberian Peninsula to begin manuscripts with images of the temple vessels. And only after several, several pages of these beautiful micrographic images, we get the, to the liturgy itself uh, with this fantastic gold leaf opening and uh, typically Spanish semi-cursive script. What, what's amazing is that, um, I, you, you know, that the, the text being used to draw the pictures are from Tehillim or Psalms. So you're taking Jewish passages, even though you're drawing non-Jewish images or images that are not uniquely Jewish, like a dragon or a knight, um, you're using Jewish text. And there's something very beautiful about that interaction between the secular and the religious, like turning it all into something which religious. Is, which is fairly typical of the artistic tradition. Of, of the Middle Ages. Another unique aspect of this machzor, uh, like several other uh, medieval machzorim, is that they uh, contain essentially the liturgical poems. They preserve the unique traditions of the community and kind of work under the assumption that people know the basic liturgy either by heart or out of a different text. And part of the importance of this manuscript is its preservation of the Catalonian liturgical tradition. So what you're talking about are the piutim, right? The liturgical poems that we call piutim. And um, often the themes are, um, there's a uniformity or a similarity to the themes of piutim, uh, which are about the coronation of God as king, uh, the shofar as a cry that is meant to awaken us, God remembering and judging humans and their actions and our intentions to repent. And, and I think what's almost, um, uh, a, not a tragedy, but is, I, in, in Hebrew, we would say chaval, right? It's something that I... It's disappointing. Dis disappointing is that we don't really connect to these PU team. The language is very old fashioned and esoteric. It reflects the language of communities hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And as scholars, we can unpack them and see the beauty of the text. But in the contemporary age where communities still say some of those PU team, they're often said, but not really felt because the language is just too, too distant. Which is a shame. Um, I want to take a look at one more absolutely stunning manuscript, an Italian uh, manuscript of the Yom Kippur tradition uh, on super thin and fine parchment uh, with some of the loveliest line drawings, pen drawings that I've seen in any tradition. Here we have the Alchets, the traditional list of sins and an image of a dragon, 
a monkey, um, a bird of some kind. Uh, and and these, these line drawings are just wonderful. And I'll also say you really need to get very close, look close up to see the intricate detail. From the distance, you see the picture, but only when you get close can you see how finely detailed every drawing is. And here is the gates. God opens up the gates of heaven to our prayers. Uh, and there's an elaborate entrance to some kind of, of castle. Uh, and here we have some uh, kind of deliberately, no doubt deliberately funny drawings of goats and other creatures eating the letters, <laughs> yeah, I um, which I suspect during the long prayers could also serve as a kind of humorous distraction uh, in the synagogue. Which we all sometimes need, let's be honest. Um, and so really what we've seen is that throughout the centuries, you know, in the aftermath of a destruction in which the center of Jewish worship, right, the, the temple and the sacrifices is, is no longer a real shift, especially on the days in which we're meant to create connection to God, to a uniform liturgy, and at the same time, passages like Piyutim, which are unique to individual communities, and how much effort, time, and expense is put into uh, handwriting, essentially beautiful, beautiful machzorim with illuminations, with detail, with, uh, with little drawings. And that really reflects the commitment the community has to continue praying these prayers and making sure, at least for the prayer leaders, these texts are very available. And these are only the beautiful items that have survived. Many haven't, unfortunately. Nechama, thanks for visiting and giving us an opportunity, an excuse to flip through these marvelous artifacts and to discuss the nature of what can be very heavy and very challenging holidays, but in some ways very freeing uh, and very cathartic ones as well. Mm -hmm.